from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snow. Well, the good news is I don't have cancer. There's no lymphoma, but I still have a tumor in my head. Thank you for downloading my fly fishing educational podcast. This is the 12th year and nearly 300th episode. My name is Rob Snow White. That is my real last name. You can skip over the first 20 or so minutes of the podcast. Once I get through the intro, that's just me catching you all up with stuff that's been going on here. First, I want to say this podcast is brought to you by Corkers. Second, there's a GoFundMe out for Justin Aldrich. Justin is a professional fly tire. He makes his income in fly fishing. And he's really sick right now. His Crohn's disease is causing some major flares, a lot of hospitalizations, and a lot of medical bills. There is a guided trip you can go bid on or donate to. And the links will be on iTunes and my blog page. Corkers, so they've got the new River Ops boot available. It's a tactically inspired wading boot built for guide caliber performance. The boot's designed to take users deep into the backcountry with a level of durability, stability, and comfort never before seen in water-specific footwear, now available at participating retailers. The features on this new boot include Exotech protective exoskeleton with no exposed stitching a 360 degree molded abrasion resistant protection in a flexible hyperlight package. There's enhanced heel cups for maximum stability and protection. There's a lace lock customized by zonal fit. You can get Vibram soles. They have hydrophobic fast drying materials. And of course, because they're corkers, Omnitrax. Customizable, patented, interchangeable outsole systems let you adjust your traction on the fly to suit the terrain. These are starting off at $259. So I'm gonna talk now for a couple minutes. Before we get into muskies, just let you know what's been going on on my end. So back in early October, started having some trouble breathing. Just at night in general, was just normally congested. Been pretty good for about three years now with my congestion that I haven't had any issues. And it was starting to really get to me. So Columbus Day weekend, we're at an Airbnb and I just can't breathe at all out of my head. So I go to the family dollar and I get some Afrin, start using that. Awesome. Man, I love Afrin. That was a great weekend too. That was the last time I caught a brook trout. Made me super excited. It's one of the last fun days I've had really in a long time. Come home, starts getting into later October, early November, and I'm just flabbergasted by why I'm so congested, kind of run down thinking maybe I need to take some more Benadryl at night just to dry me up or some NyQuil. I'm going to leave some of the gross things out. And then things start progressing and I'm not feeling really any better. And I've been dealing with congestion and, and stuff my whole life, allergies. So I start vacuuming some more in the house and that's not really doing it. And then I get a humidifier for the master bedroom. I love it. It's a great humidifier. You don't have to remove it to fill it up. It's super awesome. And then you know, December's coming around and I'm still having to use Afrin three times a day, waking up in the middle of the night to use it, taking hot showers, vacuuming, humidifier, Benadryl. And then early January, I get the idea that, you know what? I'm going to use a neti pot. I'm having some hot tea right now. Today's the first day my kid's back to school in a whole year. So I can comfortably finally record, have a nice pot of tea and relax. So I recently had thrown out my Neomed squirt bottle, not the neti pot where you tilt and it goes up your nose, but the kind where you squeeze. It's a sinus rinse. Since I hadn't needed it for years, I'd thrown it out last fall, right before all this happened. So I order it on Amazon because I just don't want to go to the stores if I can avoid it. And I get the water all warmed up. I put in the saline salt and I'm in the shower and I squirt it up my nose. And all of a sudden I just hear it going to my left ear tubes and I'm <laughs> shaking my head and banging on it and tilting my head upside down. And this water's not coming out. 
So I squeeze, flush out the other side of my nose. Nothing really comes out. And I end up just hanging out in the shower, trying to blow my nose, trying to unclog my ear. And I get out of the shower and I, and I still have water in my ear. And it sounds like cellophane, old people, candy wrappers crinkling in my ear. And it's really awful. And then I'm like, all right, you know, I've gotten water in my ear from the pool before. I'm just going to chill for a couple of days and, and it'll get better. By Saturday, I am signed up for a four mile run cleanup and I can't hear anything out of my left ear at this point. So it sounds like I'm talking with a bucket on my head. I try to talk to people there and I'm just like, you know what? I can't talk today. It's just too uncomfortable and too weird. And a couple of days go by and I'm like, dude, this has been a week. I still got water in my ears. So I start Googling things like mineral oil and or olive oil and rubbing alcohol or something. And I use drops and I sit there for a couple hours watching the TV. Absolutely nothing. I bang on my head. Nothing. I do heating pads on my head. Nothing. This is going on for like two weeks now. I sit on the couch with my head upside down. Absolutely nothing. And this podcast was recorded before this happened or was written, I should say. And not being really able to talk because it's uncomfortable to hear, I haven't recorded this. So now we're going on to two and a half weeks. And I go to Wegmans. It's the last time I was actually at Wegmans or a grocery store, which was... We had dinner guests February 6th, so I've not been to the grocery store since January, and I'm starting to get at, just at my wit's end. I, I've got podcast interviews coming up, and I, I can't really hear or talk. Just other things. I, I'm at this, I went somewhere, and just I can't hear, so people are shouting at me in the backyard, when we have company over. I'm talking louder, and then a Saturday comes up of the 6th, the day we're supposed to have clients. And I'm wearing my buff over my face. It's not a cold day, but my nose is running. I'm with clients. So it's running and soaking my buff. So I keep having to rotate it until I've just got like a cold band of snot now just across my head where it soaks into the buff. I turn it a little bit to the right clockwise. I get home to start cooking and it was a Thai meal. It's freaking amazing. And the whole time I'm cooking, my nose is running and I'm basically about to get a tampon and stick it up my nose. I'm like, I can't hear out of my ear. And now my nose is running. Seriously, what is going on? And then I start sneezing and just, it was a mess. And I'm trying not to get snot in the food because you just don't want to do that. That's just gross. So on Monday morning, I call to make an appointment that afternoon. And they're like, yeah, come in. You know, we'll drain your ears. We'll take a look, etc." My daughter had to have been somewhere. I must have dropped her off either at my wife's up the street with Fred or dropped her off at a friend's house because I was alone. So I go to the ear, nose, and throat doctors, most efficient office I've ever been at. I've been there 10 years ago when I had sinus surgery because I had trouble breathing back then. And it's gotten to the point now where I'm so congested that I can't really eat because my head is so congested, I can't hear and if I try to breathe while I'm chewing, I'm afraid I'm going to suck in food and I'm going to suffocate, choke. So like, all right, we're going to look up your, your ears and nose. They start looking up there. And first question is, are you a smoker? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not a smoker. And I tell them I've done everything to try and get the water out of my ear. And I even took, when I was cutting my hair, I took the hair clippers and just stuck that on the left side of my head and made it vibrate for five minutes just trying to dislodge the water. I'm explaining all this. She's like, let's go in the exam room. We're gonna, we're gonna do some further looking. If you go in there, they aerosol me with lidocaine, leave and come back. And I'm seeing that there's a camera, it's like a handheld camera with a long tube of about 10 inches long, maybe the diameter of the straw on WD-40. And she looks up my nose, I can't feel anything. She's poking around and She's asking some questions. I'm trying not to move because I've got this thing up my head. She asks if I have HIV. And I said, no. She says, are you elderly? I said, no. She's like, hmm. Well, the reason your ear's not draining is because there's a mass in your nasopharynx and it's blocking the drainage of the tubes. And she's asking me some more questions and the tone starts changing. And it's sort of like when you're watching a movie and they're in a couple's having a sonogram 
and the, the nurse sees something and the couple get a little scared and then the nurse is like, excuse me, I'll be right back. I need to get a doctor. That's what happened. The, she leaves, she goes out to get the doctor and the doctor comes in and the mood is completely changed by now. It's not like, Hey, how's it going? Funny water in my ear, putting hair clippers on my ear to vibrate the water out. He needs to look up there and then look at the scans. He confirms there's, there's a, a considerable mass is what they called it at the time. And that I was going to need to uh, have some more testing done. And at this point, things get a little serious. It's, it's definitely no more joking around about not being able to hear. So they schedule me for a CT scan of my head for a couple of days from then. So this is the 7th or 8th of February. I call my dad and my brother and tell them that I've been diagnosed with a tumor. And mind you, it's only been two months since my mom died. So it's a little nervous driving home. I'm a little scared. And I say, you know what? Same thing with my mom. Y you can't stress over things you have no control over. And then I Googled nasopharyngeal mass, which led to nasopharyngeal tumor, which then led to, they don't, come out benign really and it's more like cancer so now I'm starting to think holy crap maybe I've got cancer and I'm starting to feel worse it feels like sinus infection with my glands in my neck hurting and shooting pains going vertically and horizontally in my head and just down into my chest I get the CT scan which was easy that was on Friday so the next Monday they call me in to go over the, the results and it turns out that my tumor is several centimeters by several centimeters. I don't know, maybe the size of a freaking huge grape, maybe the size of one of my cicada flies. Uh, I'd say maybe a large grape or cherry tomato. So now we've got to schedule surgery to go in and biopsy it. Because now it's large, it is definitely interfering with my quality of life, and they're gonna schedule surgery. So later on in the week, I've got to go do my pre-op. I've got to do a COVID test. And when I'm doing the COVID test, it's drive through I can't hear what the lady's saying. And I feel like crap. It's been two and a half weeks now. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I've lost eight pounds maybe. And I just feel absolutely horrible. At this point, the DOD gives the wife a week off to, to be home and help me leading up to the surgery. She's supposed to be in Colorado on her ski trip. And she's got to stay home with me now, help with the kid who's been home for an entire year. And then me just moping around the house, just feeling like absolute garbage. So it's the feeling like garbage. And then I, at this point, I am 100% sure I've got cancer and, and I need to start making arrangements. So the Steelhead guys all get texts that they can come over and start picking stuff out and they can pick out boats. Uh, the wife wants to know what to do with the boat, wants to know what to do with the gear and basically all of my belongings in case something happens. So the week leading up to the surgery, I'm basically sleeping two hours a night. I'm not eating, uh, watching burn notice on reruns. I'm not tying flies. I'm really not doing anything. It's cold, it's raining, it's wet. I started noticing in December that I started drinking more tea at night than an evening bourbon. And I have all this mint tea left over from when my mom died. So a lot of just tea hanging out and just my buddies are hanging out over here. The neighborhood dads just, you know, having a beer, coming over, talking, just helping me through it. Cause then the mental part starts going downhill that I've got a nine-year-old and what's going to happen to her. My wife will be fine. She'll get over it, but I'm more worried about my kid of me not being around. And then I've got all these podcasts recorded. Then in the future, she can hear me and listen to me, and which is sort of the whole point of this anyway. When she's older, if something happens to me. So now surgery's coming around and my dad drops me off in the morning and I go in, prep me and everything. They drop my IV in the operating room and they start asking me questions and that's when they drug me 
That's a great feeling when the anesthesia kicks in. And then I wake up with a popsicle in my hand. And the next thing I know, I'm in a wheelchair going to the car. And then there's bright sunlight outside. And then I'm in bed. I sleep until three or four. I, I got home. I mean, I was the first one going in at six in the morning. So I was done by seven. They biopsied the tumor. They took a bunch of it out. They scraped it and carved it down. And I immediately started feeling better. The pressure was released in my head. I could swallow better. My glands don't hurt as much. My sinuses are relieved in pressure. And I'm doing much, much better. So we've got now a week leading up to the results. Uh, I'm still not feeling great. And my throat really hurts from the, the breathing tube or whatever. And I'm still just down. I'm still convinced something horrible is going to happen on Monday, March 1, when they we go in and, you know, just leading up to this, just sad phone calls, people reassuring me, people praying for me. I'm talking to a, a rabbi friend in Ohio, reaching out to friends and family, just giving them a heads up. Maybe something bad's coming in the future down the road. So my wife drives me in on Monday and I'm just bummed. I'm convinced I'm walking out having to go to an oncologist and I already decided I'm not going to do chemo. I, I don't do nausea. I don't like vomiting. And I sort of just determined, you know, what is this going to come down to? And then how are they going to get rid of a tumor that's in my head? So we go to the doctor's office and five people come in and I look at my wife and I'm just like, holy crap, this, this is really bad. And the doctor walks in and he says, it's benign. And it didn't really hit me for a couple hours later that my tumor is benign. And he says, you don't have lymphoma. They were 95% sure at the time of the biopsy that I had malignant cancer of my nasopharynx. He said that as he was biopsying and just handling it, it had all signs and texture of being malignant and that my fears and sadness leading up to it were completely justified and that everything I'd been going through was completely normal. I'm on prescription medications now that you squirt up your nose to help minimize the tumor. They scraped a bunch of it away and I was on antibiotics for a week that completely wrecked my stomach. We bumped into Thomas at a farmer's market like two blocks from his house. We went up just drive around DC last weekend for my wife's birthday. She wanted to drive the Xterra and, and just go check out the city. We bumped into Thomas and then I started feeling bad and then I was throwing up or trying to throw up all night. It was like having a stomach flu with nothing coming out. It was pretty bad. And now I'm sitting here uh, a couple of weeks from my birthday, which I didn't think I was going to get to, recording a podcast that I never thought would happen with my beautiful little daughter at school with her snow white mask on that I thought she was going to not have a dad. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. It's been a rough couple of weeks or months. I have not been emailing people back in time. Uh, fly orders have been a bit whack and just things have been just not normal here. So I want to thank the wife, my neighbors helping out, my dad, my brother. You know, before we went into that meeting with the doctor on Monday, we had the will ready and we had um, all the legal papers drawn up. We were seriously discussing donating all of my stuff if it turned out to be a death sentence. So let's end there and let's go talk about Muskie now, if you're still with me. I'm going to talk about Muskie. Again, this is everything you need to know about Muskie except how to catch them. There's possible redundant information in this podcast. There's possible conflicting information. No information in this podcast has been taken from fishing or angling sources. And if you want these notes or references, please feel free to contact me through my website. New terms we're going to introduce are precocial, hatched or born in an advanced state, hybrid vigor, meaning they grow faster and stronger than the parent fish, didontiform locomotion, propels fish, propagating undulations along large pectoral fins. The term sift predator was used and I was unable to contact the person who used that. I reached out to Gar Lab and Fish Talk and Fish Nerds on Twitter. Nobody knows what that means. So uh, muskies have been compared to tigers. They're solitary. They stock prey. They have needle sharp teeth and rows of spots or stripes on their sides. Robert Barnwell Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's uncle said, 
Believe in no one who boasts of the flavor of muscalange. Cook him as you will. He is nothing but a dirty, flabby, tasteless pickerel. And as for sport, sleep comfortably till either a call from your oarsman or a tug at your leg arouses you to the dreary work of pulling in a worthless, unresisting log. Muscalange do closely resemble other isakids, such as the northern pike and American pickerel, in both appearance and behavior. The musky lung population near the southern extent of the species ranges are relatively unstudied compared to northern populations. And what I'm going to discuss in this from what is known is their classification, their description, their behavior, their geographic distribution, feeding, reproduction, and miscellaneous information. Classification muskies are in the kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Class Osteichthyes, Order Salmoniformes, Family Isacidae, Genus Esox, Species Masquinagi, M A S Q U I N O G Y. They were described or written as Esox Masquinagi by Mitchell in 1824. These fish are raffin fishes, they are Actinopterygii. The isociforms are pikes and mud minnows, and isocidae is the family of pikes. For etymology of the binomial nomenclature of the organism, isox is from the Greek isox. The scientific name for muscalunge is not Latin, but is Ojibwe, word mashkanuj, meaning ugly pike. Muscalunge probably derived from maskinange, fairly close to the original Ojibwa word, and lunge, taken from Native American name for lake trout. These are not lake trout that you'd find in Baltimore on fried food restaurants. Completely different for those that are local. Esox is an old name for the pike in Europe. Masquinage in Cree, mask means deformed, and kinaji means pike. The French settled North America and referred to the animal as masque Alange. And I'm going to pause here. If you skipped earlier, uh, they also put tubes in my ears. I forgot to mention that. I can, it sounds like there's a low drone plane flying over my head right now. I can also burp through my ears and I can no longer equalize pressure. I just want to say that if I sound a little thrown off, it's because I'm hearing weird things in my ears right now. Also, I don't like the wind. Cold wind is really bothering and uncomfortable for me. So I'm going to go on from there. Um, just as I'm talking, it's still weird hearing myself. And I got a yawn here. <clears throat> okay. The Masquinagi stemmed from Ojibwa, the Chippewa Indian name for this fish. Ojibwa word Masquinuj, meaning great fish, meaning big pike. The Algonquian word locally here is Masquinunja. The French Canadian word is either Masquinage or Masquinage, depending on the spelling. The English, before settling on the common name muscalunge, a variety of names were used, including muscalunge, muscalange, muscaltlange, milliganong, maskinange, maskalange, muskinunge, and masquinage. So there are three species of muscalunge. The Great Lakes muscalunge, or spotted muscalunge, E. M. Masquinange is the most common variety in the Great Lakes Basin and surrounding area. The Chautauqua muscalunge, or barred muscalunge, E. M. Ohioensis, is known from the Ohio River system, Chautauqua Lake, Lake Ontario, and the St. Lawrence River. The clear muscalunge, E. M. Immaculatus, is most common in the inland lakes of Wisconsin, Minnesota, northwestern Ontario, and southern Manitoba. The tiger muscalunge, this is for Thomas, E. masquinagi, X. lucius, or E. lucius, X. masquinagi, is a hybrid of the muskie and the northern pike. The meager fossil evidence for muscalunge shows that they arose in the Miocene epoch in the Neogene period. It was long believed that muscalunges were just evolved northern pike. However, we now know they evolved independently of northern pike. The family of Socidae most likely evolved from herring, salmon order of fishes, and has been present on Earth for at least 80 million years. 
the evolution probably occurred during the mid to late Cretaceous period between 80 and 90 million years ago. It was previously believed that the Esox genus evolved in Eurasia from Paleo Esox Fritesci, though through Esox Papyrusius, until under 2 million years ago, Esox Lucius evolved and dispersed through the Northern Hemisphere and into North America via the Bering Strait land bridge. The discovery of a fossilized skeleton of Esox Timeni from 60 million years ago in Canada disproved the original belief. Discoveries since have put E. Timeni on Earth about 80 million years ago before Paleo Esox, which had been considered its ancestor. This discovery also puts Esox in North America between 30 and 50 million years before it appeared in Europe. The E. Timeni of North America and Paleo Esox Fritesci of Europe followed similar evolutionary paths up until a glacial period in the Pleistocene epoch. The P. Fritesci of Eurasia, after evolving into two other species, eventually died out in Eurasia. The E. Tianami of North America evolved into E. Maskinongi, the Muscalonge, about 25 million years ago, and as the continent moved farther north, evolved into E. Lucius, the northern pike, which was much more tolerant of the colder climate. I gotta say, this much talking with ear tubes, it's kind of strange. Now I'm gonna discuss the description of this fish. Muskie are the largest member of the Esox or pike family. The body plan is typical of ambush predators. Their body shape allows for minimum water resistance. Their body shape is fusiform. It is streamlined, torpedo-shaped with an elongated body. They kind of look like a, a freshwater barracuda. The fins are pointed and rust-colored. There's a single soft dorsal fin located directly above the anal fin. The dorsal, pelvic, and anal fins are set far back on the body. There are usually 19 rays in the dorsal fin, and the fins are greenish to red-brown with dark blotches. Unpaired fins are often blood-red after capture. The tail is lobed, which allows for greater directional influence with less flaps. The pointed ends of muscalunge acts as a sharper rudder in the water. The head is dark above and paler on sides and is marked with spots or several dark bards radiating back from the eyes. They have a flat head and a duckbill shaped mouth. Due to flexible jaws, Muskies can eat an organism up to 30% of its body size. The jaws can lock into position and wait for the prey to die in the muskie's mouth. Fish teeth have evolved from scales that covered the lips of primitive fish. They are made up of a bone-like substance called dentine covered with enamel. Like our teeth, they have a pulp cavity in the center containing blood vessels and nerves. Muskies can have from 500 to 700 teeth, possibly more teeth in larger individuals. Teeth are made for grasping, not tearing chunks out of meat. Larger, older fish will, in fact, be missing quite a few of their main teeth. They probably break off due to age and use. Teeth can be up to one inch long. Needle-like teeth located on the tongue, a roof in the mouth, and musky jaws and teeth are not designed to take large bites out of its food. Instead, again, those teeth are designed only for grasping. The roof of the mouth and tongue teeth are angled backward to prevent prey from exiting the mouth and to assist turning prey direction to head first to swallow. The roof of the mouth has much shorter, almost brush-like teeth that are used to help grip its food as it tries to swallow. Sharp teeth in the lower jaw with smaller backward curved teeth in the upper jaw will vary greatly by age and size. And most muskies have probably hundreds of smaller brush-like teeth that they use for gripping its prey as they swallow them. There are four types of teeth in a muskie. You have canine, vomer, palatine, and dentary. The canine teeth line the outer edge in rows on the upper and lower jaw. 
the canine teeth are used when hunting. The number of larger canines in the mouth can vary. You can usually find that the much larger older fish will in fact be missing quite a few of their main teeth. They probably break off due to age and use. Vomer and palatine are the tooth bearing bones of the roof and the mouth. These teeth are much shorter, almost brush like teeth that are used to help grip its food as it tries to swallow. Something I've had trouble doing because I've had a tumor in my head. Vomerine teeth, the main teeth that are used when hunting, are the large canines that can be found on the outer rows of both the upper and lower jaw. Vomer is a central bone and bars a single club shaped patch of teeth. The vomerine tooth patch is greatly constricted at the neck. Rarely more than two larger teeth in a cross row on the neck. Palatine teeth. Each palatine tooth patch bears three to four canine like teeth are longer and larger than the adjacent teeth. Adjacent to the larger canine like teeth on each side of the vomer. And finally, Dentary teeth. These are robust, uniformly tapered, and slightly recurved. And I want to find so much more about musky teeth without having to go to fishing websites, and I just couldn't do that. These fish do have pores, P O R E S, six to 10 submandibular pores. That means underside of the lower jaw. These are sensory pores on the underside of the jaw to detect slight vibrations and help the muscalunge to find its prey in murky or dark waters. Pores act as a lateral line system for the underside of the fish. These pores allow muscalunges to approximate prey's distance below them so they can swoop in a dramatic kill. There are 17 to 19 slender bones. Those are branchiostegal rays in the membranes along the lower edge of the gill cover. The lateral line of the musky, and again, you can spell musky, M-U-S-K-I-E, or M-U-S-K-Y. There's no wrong way to spell it with those two. The lateral line. The family Isocidae's lateral line system includes lengthwise rows of pores along each side, as well as pores scattered over the body and head including those on the underside of the jaw. Slight vibrations on the water, such as those produced by swimming bait fish, activate tiny hairs inside the pores. These hairs, in turn, stimulate nerves inside and enable the muscalunge to home in on its prey, even in murky water or under dim light conditions. There's 130 to 157 cycloid scales in the lateral line. The three musky subspecies are adapted to their native areas, where their colors and markings provide them with camouflage. Due to stocking efforts, it is not unusual to find two or all three of the subspecies swimming in the same waters. Coloration is usually dark markings on a light background, and it is believed that the body color of each species changes according to the season of the environment. We're continuing here with the description, post-lateral line. Adults have the back, head, and upper sides of the body iridescent greenish gold to light brown, and the flanks range from green gold to brownish to gray or silvery. Silvery specimens, there are no dark markings or only faint dark markings. Musky in the St. Lawrence River Great Lakes region exhibit a spotted pattern more frequently than fish found in other locations. The ventral surface is cream colored to milky white with small brown to gray spots or blotches. Young muskies display prominent bars and spots. And muskies from the upper Mississippi watershed and Great Lakes, including Lake St. Clair, are generally spotted. Inland muskies in the Midwestern United States fall in the barred or clear phases. Light colored bodies, they have light silver, brown, or green. Dark vertical stripes on the flank, which may tend to break up into spots. In some cases, markings may be absent altogether, especially in fish from turbid water. And scales found in the upper half of the cheek. Musky generally fall into one of a combination of or three distinct color phases. 
spotted, barred, or cleared. The spotted muskie, Isox masquinagi masquinagi, are native to the St. Lawrence River, the Great Lakes, and their tributaries. They have been imported to many other regions of the United States. The spots in the body form oblique rows, and they're characterized by small, dark green or black spots on a light green or silver background. This type sometimes is called a leopard muskie. If the background is darker than usual, it may be called a black panther muskie. Wakanda forever. The barred muskie, similar to the spotted muskie, Isox masquinegi ohioensis, has markings with bands or large blotches of dark coloring on a light background. They were originally found only in the Ohio River and its tributaries. Barred muskies can now be found living and reproducing in waters far from their natural habitat. And then you have the clear muskie, Esox masquinagi immaculatus, a natural resident of the rivers and lakes of Ontario and Manitoba, as well as Minnesota and Wisconsin in the United States. They're slow growers, not as widely stocked away from their natural range as the other two subspecies. They're rarely seen in the United States beyond their native waters, and they range in color from silver to deep green with very faint spots or bands, if any. Muskies display sexual dimorphism. The males are smaller than the females. In adult female muskie, the urogenital region resembles the shape of a pear, while an adult male muskie lunge, the shape of the region resembles a keyhole. You break those facts out at your next cocktail party. Say, Barbara, have you heard about the urogenital region of a muskie? Yeah, it resembles the shape of a pear. I bet you didn't know that, Barbara. Due to genetics, females determine the sex of the offspring. Muskies are typically 28 to 48 inches in long with a maximum 183 centimeters. So typically 71 to 122 with a max length of 183. Some have reached up to six feet or 1.8 meters and 70 pounds or 32 kilograms. The average weight is 15 to 36 pounds or 6.8 to 16.3 kilograms. Alexa, what is 15 pounds in kilograms? 15 pounds is about 6.8 kilograms. You want to see something else that's cool about Alexa? Alexa, what is the tide? Zip it. Alexa, what is the tide for what? Alexa, what is the tide for Washington, D.C. today? Today, Washington, D.C. has low tide at 5.32 a.m., high tide at 11.01 a.m., low tide at 6.09 p.m., and high tide at 11.33 p.m. Pretty cool, right? The maximum published weight is 31.8 kilograms. Martin Arthur Williamson caught a muscle lunge with a weight of 61.25 pounds or 27.8 kilograms in November of 2000. At first, muskies grow very rapidly, reaching approximately 12 inches by the end of their first growing season, 24 inches by the end of their second, and 30 inches by the end of their third. As musky lunge grow longer, they increase weight. However, the relationship between length and weight is not linear, but I have a graph that says it could be. Musky inhabiting waters without northern pike rarely reach total lengths of more than 40 inches, while muskies in the presence of northern pike occasionally surpass 60 inches. The maximum reported age of a muskellunge is 30 years. Females grow faster and live longer than males. Growth rates depend on one, the amount of food available, two, the size of the body of water, and three, the summertime water temperature. Muskies eat larger fish during the summer and fall to get ready for winter. In the winter, they eat small prey fish that are easy to catch so they don't expel a lot of energy. Winter, they don't move around as much and eat small fish that are easier to catch to conserve energy during the winter months. Art has reported a 50 inch muskie was caught out of Burke Lake within the last two weeks. It's an old fish. And now for Thomas Perkins's tiger muskie corner. The tiger muskie was believed to be a separate species until scientists succeeded in crossing a northern pike with a muskie lunge, thereby discovering the tiger's muskie's true origin. 
They are a natural occurring hybrid cross of the muskie and the northern pike. While such hybrids sometimes occur naturally, tiger muskies are usually bred in fisheries. Tigers display hybrid vigor, meaning they grow faster and stronger than the parent fish and are also less susceptible to disease. They can live up to 19 years in the wild. If temperatures rise fast enough, after ice out, instinct will force both species into the spawning grounds at the same time, which can result in a hybrid. There you have it. If temperatures rise fast enough after ice out, instinct will force both species into the spawning grounds at the same time, which can result in a hybrid. Hybrids are sterile, although females sometimes unsuccessfully engage in spawning motions, aka sterile pike musky hybrids. Sterile organisms spend their energy feeding as they do not need to spend energy on gamete production and spawning activities and thus get bigger faster. Tiger muskies are sometimes confused with the barred muskie, but the markings are distinctly different. Tiger musculunge display characteristics of both parents. Body of the tiger muskie is slightly deeper than that of either comparable length parent. The cheeks and jaws are usually spotted with 10 to 16 pores existing on the underside of the jaws. The tips of the tail are more rounded than in the true muskie and the fins have distinct spots. In very large specimens, the fins, especially the tail fins, appear to be much larger for a comparable true muskie. Tiger muskie generally have both bars and spots, making it appear more like a muskie than a northern pike. But the tiger muskie tail is usually rounded like the northern pike. Their tail, the caudal fin, and the two sets of paired fins will be how you know for sure if it is a tiger muskie. They will be rounded like that of a pike as opposed to a point like on a muskie. Five to six chin pores in each side and partly scaled gill covers, the operculum, and fully scaled cheek like the northern pike. The tail fin, again, is more rounded than that of the muskie and there are irregular dark stripes and dot markings on the sides of their bodies. Their patterns continue up and over their backs. Barred muskies have dark markings on light backgrounds and their patterns do not cross their backs. The hybrid muskie has a shorter, stockier body and fins are more rounded than like those of a pike. There is no sexual dimorphism in male and female tiger muskies. Tiger muskies grow faster than pure muskies, but do not attain the ultimate size of their pure relatives as the tiger muskie does not live as long. They grow faster and larger than northern pike, but they are less finicky than muskies and endure higher water temperatures than either species, faster growing than their parents. They can tolerate higher temperatures. And because they are sterile, they are often used to stock lakes and rivers outside the natural range of the parent species because their numbers can be easily controlled. Yeah, tell that to Samuel L. Jackson from uh, Jurassic Park, man. He begged to differ. Tiger muskies prefer shallow water, two to three meters or six to nine feet, and they travel half as much in the summer and fall as it does in the winter to spring, when it prefers deeper water of five to nine meters or 15 to 30 feet deep. In the fall and summer months, these fish tend to prefer a habitat where waters range from six to nine feet. They prefer these shallow waters due to the pond weed that they can lurk in. Tiger muskies depend on heavy vegetation, stumps, and logs, which they can dwell under. In the winter and spring seasons, the tiger muskies tend to live in more open waters, where the depth ranges from 16 to 32 feet. They go much deeper in these months because their desire for food and their metabolisms greatly decrease. Studies showed that during the fall and summer months, tiger muskie stayed in an area of about 120 acres. However, during the colder winter and spring seasons, the tiger muskie increased their roaming area to 340 acres. This was the same from year to year, which is very similar to the seasonal patterns that its parents, the northern pike and muskie, display. Breeders prefer to breed male northern pike and female muskie lunge because the eggs are less adhesive 
and have less tendency to clump when hatching. Muskies are not northern pike and tiger muskies. There are four major morphological distinctions between pure muskie lunge and northern pike. Pike have dark bodies with light markings. The first and most obvious of the four is the scale pattern. Tiger muskies have dark vertical stripes going down the side of their sleek torpedo-like bodies, similar to a tiger, hence why they're called a tiger muskie. Pure muskies can vary from elongated spots to no pattern at all, while northern pike, on the other hand, have distinct spotted patterns. You got to bear with me, too, because uh, the tumor's pushing on my throat. Mm. The next morphological difference can be seen in the caudal fins, a.k.a. tail fins and the belly fins. For northern pike and the tiger muskie, the belly and caudal fins are rounded. Pure muskie, they are pointed and come to a sharper point. The third difference can be found by looking at the scales on the cheek. Cheeks on pure muskies are only scaled in the upper half. In addition, unlike pike, muskies have no scales on the lower half of their opercula. The cheeks on pike have the entire cheek covered. And the last major morphological difference and hardest to identify are the number of mandibular pores on each side of the three esockets. A reliable method to distinguish the two similar species by counting sensory pores on the underside of the mandible, northern pike have five mandibular pores. Pure muskies have six to nine mandibular pores, while tiger muskies inherit a little from both, giving it five to eight pores. Now we know all about the physical characteristics of a muskie, let's learn about their personality and behavior. Muskie are deliberately stocked for sport fishing purposes in many waters outside their natural range. Imported muskies are destructive to native species, and some states ban such introductions of non-native species from that region. Muskie are a top predator in fresh waters of the Great Lake regions. They're non-migratory. They're carnivorous. They prosper in lakes with a wide range of depths and large beds of aquatic plants, such as pond weeds, cabbage, bulrushes, arrow leaf, pickerel weed, and water lilies, and medium to large rivers with deep pools and areas of slow moving water. Muskies are also found in clear, deep lakes with few weeds. Larger lakes tend to produce larger muskies. There have been instances where these fish hunt in small, unorganized packs. Muskies are tactile and chemical communicators. Could not find much else on that. They have diodontiform locomotion, which propels the fish, propagating undulations along large pectoral fins. Muskies can reach speeds of nearly 30 miles an hour in short bursts. They use short bursts to ambush, not to pursue. Muskies are mostly solitary, they sometimes swim in loose packs consisting of small numbers of individuals. They are very territorial animals and do not like to infringe on each other's space. Muscalunge are sometimes gregarious, forming small schools in distinct territories. Relatively small home ranges, but they are known to roam more during spawning and when food is in short supply. Musky lay in wait near the shoreline, often in shallow water. It hides in weeds near or under logs and rocks. In the summer, as the water warms up, muskies move to the cooler waters at lower depths. They will remain close to shallow water using drop-offs for cover. Muskies can stand water up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Muscalunges like to sun themselves. Although they are cold-blooded creatures, one website stated they're warm, they still enjoy the warmth of the sun on their skin. However, although a musky lunge likes to catch sun rays in a certain location, they may not call that area home. For some unknown reason, muskies seem to enjoy sunning themselves. On calm, sunny days, they often lie motionless with their backs almost out of the water. These muskies are healthy and sometimes catchable if approached without being spooked. Kind of like a mola mola. Musky lunges usually remain quite dormant during the winter months. Now we know what they look like and how they behave, let's learn where you're going to find them. Muskies are indigenous only to North America. 
However, it may have started as a saltwater species that invaded the freshwater river systems in North America, possibly becoming trapped during the Ice Age and then evolving into the species that we know today. In North America, they're native to the St. Lawrence River, Great Lakes, Hudson Bay, Red River, and Mississippi River basins, introduced elsewhere in the U.S. Native populations are protected in portions of Tennessee and Ohio. They were unsuccessfully introduced to Morocco in 1964. On average, Wisconsin Musqueam lakes have about one adult fish for every three surface acres. They're solitary. They're freshwater. Muskies are demersal. They live and feed on or near the bottom of seas or lakes. They occupy the sea floors and lake beds, which usually consist of mud, sand, gravel, or rocks. In some waters... Musculunge move offshore and remain suspended over deep water, usually in association with open water prey. Summer home ranges of musculunge are usually less than 20 acres in size. Movement is much reduced in winter, but in spring, increased movement occurs with migrations to and from spawning grounds. Again, they're not migratory, but they do live in clear vegetated lakes, quiet pools and backwaters of creeks, and small to large rivers. Makes me think of that podcast with Ellis, just talking about muskies and creeks in Ohio that he can just stumble upon. It's crazy. Muskellunge cannot endure fast currents, so they are seldom found in rivers with high gradients or drops of more than 10 feet per mile. If there are backwater areas where they can get out of the moving water, then they will live in rivers with higher gradients and faster currents. They remain in the same area of a lake, sometimes for their entire life. The larger body of water, the larger the home range. And they're usually found in fairly shallow water, 15 feet or less, but they have been caught in 40 or 50 feet deep. Muskies also associate with rocky or boulder-strewn shoals. Musky populations usually consist of about one adult for every two or three acres. They're oligotrophic. They occupy environments where the available nutrients offer little to sustain life. The term oligotrophic is commonly used to describe terrestrial and aquatic environments with very low concentrations of nitrates, iron, phosphates, and carbon sources. Mesotrophic lakes are lakes with an intermediate level of productivity. These lakes are commonly clear water lakes and ponds, with beds of submerged aquatic plants and medium levels of nutrients. The term mesotrophic, medium trophic, is also applied to the terrestrial habitats. Mesotrophic soils have moderate nutrient levels. Muskies prefer clear waters where they lurk along the edges, rock outcrops, or other structures to rest. A fish forms two distinct home ranges in summer, a shallow range and a deeper one. The shallow range is generally much smaller than the deeper range due to shallow water heating up. A muskie continually patrols ranges in search of available food in the appropriate condition of water temperatures. Let's talk about feeding now. Because muskies are just crazy predators, and that's what they're known for is the stuff they eat. So I'm going to break down what has and has not been found in a muskie's stomach. Feeding. And if you're trying to catch a muskie, you have to get it to feed. One muskrat... One ring-billed gull, 11 northern leopard frogs, and two northern pike were found in muskies. A couple of bowfin, commonly known as dogfish, were also found. Little diet information for adult tiger musk and lunch is available, especially west of the Continental Divide. Much, however, has been published about prey preference of tiger musk and lunch in labs and pond experiments. Musk and lunch are strictly carnivores. They are the top predator in any body of water where they live. Muscalunge are known as sift predators, whatever that means, I don't know. With regards to the season, muscalunges are actually very finicky eaters. They usually eat only smaller fish in the spring and raise the stakes in the fall going after much bigger prey. Most commonly, muscalunge won't eat a lot when the temperatures are below 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the spring. When temperatures are between 70 and 80 degrees, muskie lunch feeding is in full force. This elevated level of feeding continues into the fall. 
However, once the temperature is below 40 degrees, the rate of consumption greatly decreases. When temperature reaches 60, muskies feed heavily. At 80, their feeding slows down. They have a preference for larger fish over smaller fish and will eat young, weak, old, or struggling prey. Muskie do not decimate any one type of organism's population, though tiger muskies are stocked to control invasive fish populations in specific lakes and reservoirs. Muskies are selective predators, meaning they allow certain prey to go by. Although they consume a wide range of food, they are not random feeders. Some muskie lunch have exhibited prey memory, meaning they will go after their favorite prey if it is available. One example of their diet, soft fin fishes such as suckers and ciscos are important prey species, as are yellow perch and various minnows. These, along with unidentified fish, make up over 70% of their diet. Other panfish species, sunfish, rock bass, crappies, bullheads, are also eaten on occasion, making up about 15% of the diet. Let's do your math to 100, 70 plus 15, how far do we have to go? Game fish species, bass, northern pike, and other musculunge and walleye are of less importance, totaling about 8% of the diet. Muskies strike quickly with short bursts of speed. This physiological characteristic is supported by deeper portions of white muscle that aid in recovery from a short burst swimming behavior, but fatigues rather quickly. Once a muskie caches its prey in its canines, it will use the rest of its teeth to grip the prey and turn it so as to swallow it head first. It turns its food to a head first position as it's easier to swallow. And when swallowing smaller fish, such as perch and walleye, it can flatten down the dorsal fins that contain sharp spines. These are deep bodied fish with spiny fins are low on the menu, while torpedo shaped fish with soft fins are high in the menu. You don't want to poke the roof of your mouth with a, a Dorito, do you? No, they don't want to poke the roof of their mouth with a fish spine either. Again, they usually attack head first impaling its prey on large canines and then swallowing it head first. They try to get as big of a bite on the head in attempts to kill their prey immediately. Ambush predators, they will swiftly bite their prey and then swallow it. It is a very rare case to see a musky lunge approach a potential meal from behind. Most research has shown that muskies tend to utilize the most abundant prey species available in a body of water and that walleyes are not an important food for them. Muskies often take their prey to a secluded area before eating. They will eat larger prey than most other freshwater fish. And because their stomachs are so large, musky lunch can consume prey up to two thirds their own body length. Example, a 50 inch musky can eat a 33 inch long fish. They rely heavily on sight to capture prey. They depend strongly on their sight to find food. Their eyes are highly mobile, enabling them to track fast swimming prey and to see in particularly in any direction. Musky lunge also have incredible night vision, but they do not fare well in low clarity waters. Musky lunge may have more difficulty feeding at night or in waters with higher turbidity, murkiness, caused by solids suspended in the water. Reports of large muskies attacking small dogs and even humans, although most of these reports are gradually exaggerated. Larger muskies have been known to attack and consume nearly any living animal. Let's talk about what muskies feed on. Tiger muskies are known to eat birds and small mammals, as well as their own juvenile parent species, northern pike and muskie. The optimal size of each fish of bait fish is easier to live off of. The three major food items of a tiger musky diet are disgusting gizzard shad, fathead minnows, and bluegills. Tiger muskies prefer bluegills to be 25 to 30 percent of their body length. Gizzard shad are preferred to be between 30 and 36 percent. Yuck! And fathead minnows to be 37 to 43 percent. Tiger muskies target bigger gizzard shad and fathead minnows because they have soft rayed spines. These soft rayed spines make them much easier victims. 
in addition to soft raid spines, results show that shattered minnows are typically less reactant to predators and simply less aware of their surroundings, which also makes them easy targets. Bluegill, on the other hand, is very aware of its surroundings and tend to have a very quick reaction time when attacked. Bluegill also have hard raid spines, making it more difficult for predators to eat them without harming themselves. The defensive mechanisms or lack of defensive mechanisms directly associate with the bait fish that was captured most often per strike. In this case, gizzard shad were captured 78% of the time per strike, while minnows were a close second at 67% per strike. And lastly, the hard raid bluegills dropping the tiger muskies chances of a capture to 14% per strike. When tiger muskies are placed in an environment with only gizzard shad, in comparison to an environment with only bluegill, tiger muskies survive better and grow faster in the shad environment due to the shad's lack of defensive mechanisms and lack of instinctual reactions to predators because they're a stupid, ugly, disgusting, slimy, smelly fish. Here is a consolidated list of what a tiger muskie feeds on if you want to match the hatch. They feed on tench, black crappie, brook trout, white suckers, bluegills, rainbow trout, northern pike minnow, largemouth bass, yellow perch, pea mouth, bridge lip suckers, pumpkin seeds, and brown trout. The fish that muskies feed on are black bass, black bullhead, black nose dace, black nose shiner, bluegill, blunt nose minnow, bowfin, brook silver side, bullhead catfish, central mud minnow, Cisco, common carp, common shiner, gizzard shad, golden shiner, big mouth shiner, honeyhead chub, ichthyobis, also known as buffalo fish or simply buffalo, Iowa darters, Johnny darters, largemouth bass, log perch, log nose dace, creek chubs, mottled sculpins, nine spine sticklebacks, northern hog suckers, northern pike, Pumpkin seeds, bluegill, black crappy, rock bass, red horse, short head red horse, smallmouth bass, spot fin shiner, suckers, trout, perch, tulipy, walleye, white bass, white crappy, white sucker, white fish, yellow perch. <sighs> wow, could not have done that three weeks ago. Birds, because they eat birds. They eat loons, ring billed gulls, mallard ducks, and wood ducks. The herpetological specimens found within the digestive tract of a muskie are frogs, tadpoles, mud puppies, snakes, and leopard frogs. They also eat insects. Miscellaneous invertebrates include crayfish, the rusty crayfish, or the virile crayfish. And for mammals, they eat mice. They eat muskrats. They eat rats, shrews, dogs, and cats. Only humans pose a threat to an adult, but juveniles are consumed by other muskies, northern pike, bass, trout, and the occasional birds of prey. It takes 2.3 to 3.2 kilograms, or 5 to 7 pounds of live fish, to produce 0.5 kilograms, or 1 pound of muskie. Now, we know all about their geographic distribution. We know all about their classification. We know about what they look like. We know about how, where, and what they feed on. Let's talk about how they make more muskies. Well, these are oviparous. I mean, they lay eggs. They're dioecious. They do external fertilization. There's no parental care. There's no guarding by the parents. They're known as non-garters. Open water or substratum egg scatterers. Musky in the absence of northern pike, tend to reproduce in the same shallow, weedy areas that would normally be dominated by northern pike spawning during the spring. However, in the presence of northern pike, the musky lunch tend to spawn in slightly deeper water, yielding the more preferred habitat to the northern pike. Optimum spawning temperature is about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, but may range from 49 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Spawning generally occurs when water temperatures are in the 50s. The depths can have a drastic range 
up to six feet. However, they are most commonly found in shallow waters. Muskies spawn in the spring in one to three feet of water in shallow bays covered with vegetation. Males reach sexual maturity at 67 centimeters in length. Females reach sexual maturity at 77 meters in length. They spawn in mid to late spring, somewhat later than the northern pike. And adult spawners return to the same spawning ground in consecutive years. They spawn in spring as the ice melts. Muskies spawn after the northerns. Spawning seldom lasts more than a week. In lakes with northern pike and muskies, the muskies seem to have fewer numbers of surviving fry. Northerns hatch about two weeks earlier than muskies. The young northerns then feed on the smaller musky fry. Young musky fry swim just below the surface of the water. They're easily seen by fish below or birds flying over the water. There is currently an ongoing discussion concerning the methodology of how musky lunch spawn. One school of thought believes that musky lunch spawn by simultaneously extruding eggs and milt. Another school of thought believes that they may be some type of coupling is occurring during the spawning process. They spawn over again shallow vegetarian areas. Females lay between 60,000 and 100,000 eggs. A 40 pound female can produce about 200,000 eggs. As soon as the water temperature starts to rise in spring, muskies begin their migrations to the same breeding grounds as the year before. During this pre-spawn period, female muskies are eating as much as they can muster. The female feeds aggressively during pre-spawn as she bulks up her egg mass. The pre-spawn period tends to be February and March. You can catch plenty of hefty females during this time. Spawning locations include channels between lakes, river backwaters and creeks, and reservoir headwaters. Ideal locations for musky spawning will have shallow weedy beds, silted areas over rocks, dead reed stems, vegetation such as cabbage, reeds, and coontail, and finally, natural and man-made covers such as docks, felled trees, rocks, and stumps. The males arrive first and attempt to establish dominance over a territory. Male muskie arrives in favored spawning waters before the females. Then the females turn on her side to expose her abdomen to the male. The male swims against her in a forceful movement. After the male swims up to the female, the female then pauses for a moment and rests and then deposits her eggs in the sand. The eggs are usually deposited indiscriminately over several hundred yards of shoreline. If the eggs fall into poor habitat, such as where there's low oxygen, egg survival may be low. Major flow events disrupt spawning activities and prohibit newly hatched fish from feeding effectively, while extremely low flows minimize available spawning habitats within the river. High flows in the month of March followed by receding levels through June, present optimal conditions for musky reproduction and survival. Some males like it rough. After releasing their milt, the males will violently thrash their tails over where the eggs lie. This is done to spread out the milt in attempts to fertilize as many eggs as possible. Some males get so rough, they can cause lacerations to their tails. These cuts in their skin can lead to an infection and eventually death by lymphosarcoma. Holy crap, that sounds like what I had, or almost had. Maybe I'm a muskie. Hmm. No, I don't need gizzard, Chad. Unlike newly hatched pike, muskie fry don't attach to vegetation for support. Instead, they fall to the bottom of the spawning area. Small fish, crayfish, and predaceous insects often feed on the eggs. Newly hatched and larval muskies also are preyed upon by predaceous diving beetles and those creepy giant water bugs. Bass and sunfish prey on young musky lunch. Let's talk about those eggs that are getting eaten. They're negatively buoyant. They're slightly adhesive. They're translucent, amber colored, spherical, sticky to adhere to plants in the bottom of the lake. Soon afterwards, they're abandoned by the adults, and those embryos, which are not eaten by fish, insects, or crayfish, hatch within two weeks. 
The larvae live on yolk until the mouth is fully developed. When they begin to feed on copepods and other zooplankton, they soon begin to prey upon fish. Juveniles generally attain a length of 12 inches or 30 centimeters by November of their first year. Musky larvae eat plankton after absorption of that yolk sac and soon switch to a diet of strictly fish. Precocial means hatched or born in an advanced state and able to feed itself almost immediately. The fry are precocial and begin to feed on plankton, daphne, and copepods after that mouth develops. The newly hatched fry begin feeding on zooplankton. A fry musculunch juvenile will usually begin predation of other fish only four days after birth until they usually eat smaller organisms like water spiders. Musky lunge can begin aggressive predation at only two inches in length. After a few more days, they swim to eat live fish. The fingerlings will reach from seven to 13 inches by summer's end. They continue to grow rapidly during the first five years of life. Males mature in four to five years at 28 to 31 inches. Females mature in five to seven years at 30 to 36 inches. At first, muskies grow very rapidly, reaching approximately 12 inches by the end of their first growing season, 24 inches by the end of the second, and 30 inches by the end of their third. This ritual is then repeated at least one additional time. Some muskies have a second spawn, that occurs about 14 days after the first. A rock or sand bottom is preferred for spawning so the eggs do not sink into the mud and suffocate. Spawning may last five to 10 days and occurs mainly at night. Male muskies tend to stay at the spawning site for a few weeks after spawning is complete. Hopefully just waiting on an extra female, I guess. Once females are done spawning, they immediately leave the area and head back to their deeper waters. She will recuperate for a short while and then go back to being her normally aggressive self. Males move from the area after a short period of time, also heading to deeper summer waters. Now for the miscellaneous. Preservation of spawning and hiding habitat is very important. Loss and degradation of spawning and rearing habitat have been hypothesized as a major factor contributing to population declines of musculunge. Protection and restoration of these areas is essential to maintaining and restoring populations in response to anthropogenic influences of their habitat. Adult muskies have no aquatic predators. Human alterations of shoreline habitat and removal of woody debris have been linked to low oxygen conditions in sediments and reproduce failure in inland lakes. Both fishing and natural mortality greatly alter fish populations and are important in assessing and managing fisheries. Muskies that are suspended just beneath the surface of the water were once thought to be sick. Kim Driver had a muskie take a chunk out of her leg in Northern Ontario in 2020. It is referred to as having a chunk removed. The muskellunge's low reproductive rate and slow growth render populations highly vulnerable to overfishing. This has prompted some jurisdictions to institute artificial propagation programs in an attempt to maintain otherwise unsustainably high rates of angling effort in habitat destruction. In the 1800s, they were also an important commercial fish species within their native range. They have firm, lean, flesh with a low fat content and there are recipes on how to cook them they're not favorable that lymphosarcoma i mentioned the symptoms are a golf ball sized red bump on the side of the musculunge the disease is most commonly contracted around the time of spawning it is believed to be this time because the infection spreads from skin to skin contact the disease is more common in cooler waters however it has been found in various temperatures and due to the lack of knowledge of the virus, consumption of these sockets with this disease is highly discouraged. A parasite of Isocidae that you have to watch out for is Diphylobothrium sp. The tapeworm is around one inch in length and lives in the muscles of Isocids and other fish species. 
However, if ingested by human, their worm can grow in the stomach. The Skolex will attach to you. The symptoms usually include nausea and dizziness. A new parasite to Isakidae is Heterosporus. It usually infects yellow perch and has actually began to infect Isakids. The muscles of infected fish appear white. Another parasite of Isakidae is a larval roundworm, which forms golden brown cysts on the organs of the fish. This organism may be able to ride the biological magnification tidal wave into humans, so consumption of muskies is discouraged. And while they are rarely targeted for human consumption, these long-lived, slow-growing, top-of-the-line predators can accumulate contaminants such as mercury or PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. Threats to muskie populations throughout North America are habitat loss, degradation, pollution, over-exploitation, and disease or pathogens. Disease and pathogens common to muskie include Piscirrhizia, muskiepox, and viral hemorrhagic septicemia. Mercury tends to accumulate in the muscle tissues of muskies because they are long-lived, top-level predators. That's just biomagnification. And mercury concentration generally increases with the size or age of fish. This tends to be highest in fish from northern Wisconsin. And the PCBs also accumulate in muskies when they reside in waters with PCB-laden sediments. And there you have the entireness of my musky podcast. I seriously need to take a break. I, I honestly have not spoken that much in a long time. So there you have it. And then I have the musky weight versus length chart. Uh, as you go up in weight in pounds, the length increases. So a 30-inch musky is about 10 pounds. 35 is about 12. A 40-inch musky is 20 pounds. And then a 60-inch musky is 70 pounds. If you want the references for this podcast, feel free to contact me. Again, please visit corkers.com to check out the new tactical boots or drop into your fly shop, wear a mask. And if you can spare some money for the GoFundMe for Justin Aldrich, please contact me, Justin Mills. Click the link on the iTunes page where this podcast is located or go to my blog, which is linked in my social media to find out more to help Justin and his Crohn's disease flare. So help a brother out with the semicolon. Thank you so much. Next up should be PA Flyfish. Thanks for downloading my podcast. Have a great St. Patrick's Day. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.